Welcome to Road Case, the podcast that explores the live music experience. Thanks for joining us. I'm your host, Josh Rosenberg, and I'll be taking you on a journey through in-depth interviews with performers and key people in the industry to explore the magic of live music, how it can be totally transformative for both fans and performers, and we'll look at how they take it all out on the road. It's going to be a great ride, so here we go. Welcome to this very first episode of Road Case. I'm your host, Josh Rosenberg, and I, I'm super psyched to be here. Thanks to everyone out there for joining me. We have a lot of uh, really great episodes coming up on Road Case. It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, I really encourage everyone to get involved with Road Case, to send me your comments, questions, uh, suggestions for guests, or just to say hi. You can send me an email to info at roadcasepod.com. Uh, you can contact me on socials, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. We're at roadcasepod. And if you'd like, you can support me on Patreon at patreon.com slash roadcasepod. And of course, you can subscribe to this podcast on your favorite listening platform. So for our first episode of Roadcase, I'd like to welcome Eric Frankhauser. Eric is the tour manager for Wilco for the last six years. He also worked with Eels, Lucinda Williams, and Paula Cole. Eric's been in the business for a long time. His dad was in radio. He grew up in Lubbock, Texas, lived, to, lived in Austin for a little while, studied sound engineering, got plucked out of Austin, and had a baptism by fire when he was going to tour manage for Jamie Dale Gilmore and finds himself at the sound engineering board, um, at the sound board at a Central Park show where they opened for Joan Baez, and it just took off for the, from there for him. Eric's a chief problem solver. That's what tour managers need to do. Eric lives by the mantra, run to your problems, which I love and I try to incorporate into my own life. I don't necessarily always succeed, but Eric's someone who doesn't get angry at the big problems. He settles down, takes a deep breath. He's very zen about his attitude, and it's just a reflection of his own professionalism and his, um, his acceptance that tour managing inevitably comes with problem solving. There's a lot going on. There's a lot of pressures associated with it on the road, and he does a great job at approaching these problems and attacking them proactively. It's what needs to happen to make the show go on the road. It's really interesting when we pull back the curtain on Wilco, we'll see inside the tour bus a little bit, get some good stories about what happens on the road. We'll learn why the three greatest words in the English language for Eric are house lights out. He said, that's the drug. With the roar of the crowd at the beginning of a show makes it all worthwhile for him. So I want to thank you again for tuning into this interview, tuning into Road Case. I know you'll enjoy this with Eric Frankhauser of Wilco. So here we go. Hey, Eric, how are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you doing today? Good. Welcome to Road Case. Um, I'm doing great. Um, really happy to have you and talk a little bit about uh, your life as a tour manager for Wilco and other fun things like that. Um, so what's, um, what's your personal history? Like, where'd you grow up and uh, how'd you kind of get into the music business originally? Right on. Uh, I was born and raised, well, I was born on the East Coast in uh, York, Pennsylvania, so in the mm -hmm. Northeast. My father was in radio, so we actually moved around a fair amount, probably uh -huh. not as much as a military kid, but uh, he would, uh, you know, be involved with the station, get the ratings up, you know, sell it or sell his share in it, move on to the next city, town, find a station that wasn't doing well, build it up, you know, rinse and repeat. Um, right. Right. I would say the bulk of my life, or at least I consider myself as having grown up in Atlanta, Georgia, a little suburb outside of Roswell. Uh -huh. um, and the world is an incredibly tiny place. Uh, I was two doors over from Peter Buck. Well, well, well oh, wow. before yeah. RE, well before REM was a thing. Uh, right. There's a age difference there. So by the time, um, you know, I was really kind of 
anything, he was often uh, Athens already. But yeah, there's yeah. a pretty funny story. I've run into him throughout the years, and it's a pretty great story about me riding my bicycle into his car and denting it pretty badly <laughs> with my head. <laughs> was the car um, parked? The car was parked in his parents' driveway, and we lived wow. on a big hill, and I just came flying down. As we oh, did as shit. kids. It's the seventies, so there were no helmets, there was no anything. And yeah, yeah. You know, I hit it pretty good. And his dad did not like me very much and he went and grabbed <laughs> Peter. But Peter was super cool. And uh he's like, I think that scratch was already there, Dad, and I kinda wobbled back to my house. An uh, inauspicious entree into the music business. Yeah, unknowingly, unknowingly. Did you have you like circled back with him since then and had a laugh? Yeah. About that? Yeah, a couple of times. I've run into him many, many, many times. Yeah. Uh uh, in times of my time tour managing eels and also obviously with Wilco, cause there's such a tight connection right. there. Uh, but that all ended up leading to my father buying a station of his own in Lubbock, Texas. Um, mm-hmm. when I was about 14, uh, moving from Atlanta to Lubbock was a bit of a, uh, I was just, it was devastating as far as a 14 year old kid who yeah, had friends sure, and stuff yeah. was, was concerned. And you went from a place that was full of culture and interesting things to a place that didn't have anything. Yeah, uh, at all on any uh-huh. level. Our very first visit, there were literally tumbleweeds blowing through the street. I thought it was a joke. I thought I was on a movie set. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but those challenges lead to the things that sort of define you, right? So you either create yeah. while you're in Lubbock, or you know you you do some you pretty bad self damage, uh, and that led to so you which know, one me, did you choose? Uh, becoming a I, well, I became a drummer uh, at the behest of my mother. My mom wanted a family band. I have. Three brothers who are extremely talented musically. Uh, uh-huh. I am the fourth brother, and I am not on any level. I have an <laughs> oldest sister too, as well. But my mom was thinking to be the four boys who were in a family band, uh, uh-huh. and she basically assigned me drums. Um, and uh, I'm not a drummer. I had a drum set. I played a lot. Uh, just but but being loud, hard, aggressive, and demanding you're great doesn't actually make you great. <laughs> oh, really? uh, comes to come to find out. Uh, but that certainly got the bug going. And then, you know, by the time I left high school, I knew I didn't want to take any kind of normal path of lawyer or doctor or anything like that and kicked around for a while and then, uh, stumbled across a program in a small town outside of Lubbock, even a smaller mm-hmm. place called Leveland, Texas, that has a, a small community college there called South Plains College that actually has a stellar, stellar, uh, audio, uh, recording engineering program. Oh, interesting. Uh-huh. Um, it was bluegrass based. Uh, they had two studios. One was the Wayland Jennings studio and one was the Tom T. Hall studio. Right. Um, but they had everything. It was as before schools like Full Sail and stuff existed mm-hmm. um, or were at least part of the national sort of way you got into this business. Um, it was the late 80s and they just basically turned you loose. So we got as much studio time as we wanted. We could do whatever we wanted. Um, and we just learned a ton by just going in and messing up and causing problems and, you know, just when you say you, you time. mean, you mean you, your, your band students, or your fellow students. Your, yeah. Your, I mean, I buddies. bring my, what was left of my band at that point, you know, uh, which was all over the place. And, you know, when you're that age and you're not actually good, your band members change a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. and then whoever you met at school and you're like, you're like, Oh, Hey, you know, can you play the intro to rock and roll? No, but I can do it. I can kind of do it. Let's go record it, you know? Uh, but I learned a ton. And I learned at that point that I wanted to be in the audio side of the equation. Mm-hmm. Um, and I almost finished the program. Uh, I was one credit short, but I got hired by a production company in Lubbock, Texas called Electric Ear Productions, which was also surprisingly a really sort of high-end production company they right. had reba mcintyre as a client oh. which at the time was the you know kind of the creme de la creme uh-huh. uh just before i got the job working with them uh they pulled that um reba left and went to what was shoko which then became claire and other things but uh-huh. uh but that was actually great for me because that led to me walking to a vacuum um and it was sort of the same thing as school didn't necessarily know what I was doing, but I got thrown into the deep end of the ocean or water or whatever you want to call it. Right. Um, and really got to learn and experience a ton of things, not just on the audio, audio side, but on the lighting side as well. Um, and it's one of the things I cherish the most because my, my deep production background has really informed who, what, and how I am as a tour manager. 
yeah, I mean, understanding the roles of everybody that you kind of in charge with, I guess, over the, the you know, on a tour uh, or in the the whole enterprise certainly yeah. goes a long way, right? I mean, when you can, when you're telling people to do certain things or it's best to understand exactly what they're doing or you do get a lot of respect that way, right? Yeah, absolutely. Being able to speak somebody's language, whether it's the artist language, uh, just from my limited experience on stage, uh, all the way to, you know, production language. And even though technology has evolved and I couldn't sit down behind a brand new digital console today, probably, uh, but signal flow and how it works and all that stuff, uh -huh. I can still have a very, you know, in-depth conversation and you can't fool me, which is a lot more fun too, when, <laughs> when someone no, tries to, right. <laughs> when someone so tries when to say, we can't do this yeah. because of a, you're like, well, of course you can. And right, here's why. Right, and then you can see right. the frustration on their face that you know what you're talking about. So. Yeah. Or you like explain to me why this is supposed to work and they have to explain it to you and you can understand it. Right. That's yeah, probably yeah. very helpful. So your move to Lubbock actually ended up to be a good thing in the end. <laughs> yeah, it is a good thing. I still, you know, slam on Lubbock every chance I get. But the truth yeah. of the matter is I met my wife there right. um, and uh, being in Lubbock motivated me to get the hell out of Lubbock. And uh, that's what dragged me to, to Austin. You know, if you lived in Lubbock in 89, 90, 91, um, you knew all the people that came out of Lubbock. So you knew everything from, right. you know, Buddy Holly to the Flatlanders. And uh, I was lucky enough to work a lot with the Mains Brothers as sort of the uh, standby monitor guy because uh, they uh -huh. used the electric gear production for all their, their stuff. So I got to mix monitors for the Mains Brothers a ton, which gave me a ton of experience. Right. And I knew I wanted to move to Austin. And one day I was mentioning it to Lloyd Maines, actually. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's like, get out of here. You know, you've gone as far <laughs> as you can go, get out of here. Right. And so I loaded up everything I owned in my 1977 Chevy Love and moved to Austin. Nice, nice. And yeah. uh, what around what year was that? That was 93. Uh-huh. And you were, so you were, what at what period in your professional career was that? Like, where were you? Uh, I was, were you, did you? We, I was you nothing but in Austin. I moved to Austin. I'm sorry, I interrupted you, but I moved to Austin <laughs> just because I had to leave Lubbock, um, and I knew I wanted to do something in the music business. And Austin was viewed as this strange mecca of magic place where there's music and Shiner beer on tap, yeah. and you know, like all kinds of things that were just amazing. Uh -huh. um, I moved with a friend and his wife. Uh, she was going down for a, a law uh, clerkship uh, uh -huh. in Austin. And he was taking some summer classes at UT and we got back then you could rent a, an apartment in the summer for three months for nothing because all the students right. were gone. That's not something yeah, you yeah, can yeah. do now, but get a $2,000 a month apartment for 300 bucks a month. We could all afford it. Um, right. And I proceeded to spend three months doing absolutely nothing but reading books and lying in the pool <laughs> and then walking two blocks to the crown and anchor and uh, <laughs> drinking Guinness for the, yeah. the rest of the evening. And right. Three months go by, I'm out of money, I don't have a job, I haven't figured anything out. And that's when sort of everything happened for me, luckily. So. Right. Well, necessity is the mother of invention. And yeah. I literally typed up uh, on an old dot matrix printer with an old computer, uh, a resume. I sent it out to three names I got, three different managers. Right. Uh, that was on a Monday. Uh, on uh, Wednesday morning, I got a phone call from the manager of Jimmy Dale Gilmore, a guy named Mike Crowley, uh, who invited me to come to lunch and talk because he was interested in talking to me. Um, and he said, okay, well, we're let's meet here for lunch. Do you like Indian? I said, yes, I'm from Lubbock. I've never had Indian in my life. Um, <laughs> you know, I didn't know where I was going. I had to get out a map to find where this place was. And uh, But I went there and I, um, I like to think I BS my way through the interview, but I don't think Mike bought any of it. I think he just saw that I had the desire and the work ethic yeah. um, and he knew I had the production background and he knew he could probably teach me the tour managing side of it. Right. Um, that right. was on a Wednesday, Thursday, we rehearsed at what was the old arc, uh, the Austin rehearsal complex for the Archangels. We mm -hmm. you know, basically foreigner were named. Uh, that was Thursday, Friday, we flew to New York. Saturday, I'm in Central Park at uh, Summer Stages, uh, mixing Jimmy Dill Gilmore opening for Joan Baez. And that's- Wow, wow, that that's how I, fire. What was that like? That was crazy. And I was drunk with success because <laughs> right before right before I went out uh, 
to, to mix the show, uh, Mike pulled me inside and basically said, if you mess this up, you're going home. Right. And I mean, made no bones about it. Okay. Like there was no, there was no anything. I was like, okay. <laughs> um, but sort of thrived on that and, uh, had a great show, got a lot of compliments, uh, you know, all the way around. Oh, and great. I was really happy with myself and kind of smelled myself a little too much. Uh, <laughs> I was invited to dinner that night with, uh, Jimmy, uh, and some of his friends and some of his friends turned out to be people like Natalie Merchant and Dan Rather and David Byrne. Um, <laughs> and kind of a low key dinner. That <laughs> night. <laughs> well, and I was smart enough at the beginning to just like sit away and, and listen, but it was an Italian restaurant where they brought out what looked like magnums of white and red wine. And, um, at some point I said something really stupid and out loud. And I have this <laughs> memory of the entire table splitting, like Moses parting the waters and Mike just laying into me. And, oh my God. Seriously? And wow. yeah. And deservedly, deservedly. So like, you know, I was like, well, I'm the tour manager and I know how to do this. And he was just like, you know, he, he snapped to it pretty quickly as he had every right and reason to do. I should have been doing nothing but listening. I shouldn't have said a word at that dinner. Um, and I kind of realized how bad it was. And I got up and I said, got it. I'm out of here. And I walked all the way from Little Italy back to Central Park, you know, and woke up what, the next morning. You, okay. I, I, I'm compelled to ask, <laughs> what did you say? I said something, something along the lines of, well, I'm the tour manager and I'll make that decision. And keep in mind that I've never tour managed anything in my life up to this point, except I've managed to successfully get Jimmy's band from the airport to the hotel to Century Central Park. Well, that's pretty which good. Which is not exactly that didn't go sure. <laughs> it, no, not not for somebody who you know worked for the Colonel. You know, not for somebody who was born and raised by Colonel Tom Parker. You know what I mean? Like that's not going to yeah, fly. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. And Jimmy and Mike were staying the next day on the Monday to um, do press. Uh, everyone else flew home. Uh, and I think I called Mike on Tuesday morning at 10 o'clock in the morning when I knew he was back and said, Hey, look, I know I messed up. I really want this job. You know, right. Is there any well, chance that I still have it? Yeah. And, and, uh, he said, yeah, you had about five more minutes. You know, you waited too long to call. Don't wait too long to call him and apologize. next time. <laughs> yeah, really? You know, wow. so, yeah. but so looking, look, that? yeah. Looking back where you are now, like how was that instrumental and how did that kind of move you into the direction of managing, tour managing for Eels and then subsequently for Wilco? Well, that totally, I had a lot of success early on in that tour and sort of kept the job by being a pretty decent sound engineer. Mm -hmm. um, and through the course of that, I made a lot of mistakes uh, as a tour manager. Uh, Mike was on the road a fair amount, but he wasn't all the time, but he was there enough to sort of like guide me, mold me and teach me a lot of things. Uh, uh -huh. And what it taught me was, you know, you're the first up, you're the last to bed. Uh, you have to pay attention. You have to see the whole picture all the time. Always. You have to be four or five steps ahead. And um, it taught me how much I loved that, that I got way more of a thrill from that uh, and selling a show than I did from being behind the console. Uh, right. And so at that point, I decided I was going to start trying to work my way out of being a sound manager or sorry, sound engineer slash tour manager, or we called ourselves road managers back then. Mm -hmm. Somewhere along the line, we gave ourselves a promotion. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Sounds way all, better. <laughs> yeah. We're all tour managers now. Back then you were a road manager. Uh, and that totally informed me. It told, informed everything about how I do everything to this day. That year was I woke up every day, pretty sure I was fired. Um, but that was fine. Uh, right. and I worked every day to make sure I wasn't. Um, and I yeah, think that kind of yeah. trial by fire is a really good thing, uh, it instilled a lot in me, uh, and, uh, it made me know that I wanted to go in the direction of tour managing more and engineering less. And so I yeah, started trying right. to work my way towards those artists. And, right. uh, luckily in 97, um, mm -hmm. in that, you know, the music business being a small world, uh, Mike's wife, Janet Crowley, is a very well-known rock and roll travel agent. Um, she does a lot of major acts, like CSN and others. Mm -hmm. um, and the manager of Eels called her because he needed to book some flights. And in the course of that conversation, said, I need a tour manager. The person I have out now is doing sound engineer slash tour managing. He's much more of an engineer, not a tour manager. And Janet said, oh, I don't think Eric's doing anything and gave him my number. And, uh, that guy's name was John Carter known in the business as Carter. Uh, he's 
legend in many, many ways, but uh-huh. he was managing uh, Eels and Paula Cole at the time. Uh, he hired me by answering machine. I called him. He called me. I <laughs> called back and got his voicemail. He called back and, and got my answering machine. I so called your answering back. machines got to know each other really well. Yeah, it was a fascinating <laughs> story. I drove to Kinko's to fax a copy of my resume because, you know, none of us had fax machines and there certainly wasn't. Yeah, of course. Email it, was wasn't only like a, it was only like a buck a page. So Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> faxed, faxed the thing and he called back and asked how much I wanted and I immediately called back. It was some comedy of errors. I would wait by the phone waiting for this call and then something really important would take me away. And that's, you know, when he called and right, we of literally went back and forth by thing. And, um, but I got the job, flew out to LA when they were filming the rags to rags video, they had already filmed no, we came for the soul video. And yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was that. And I still, I mean, I'm still really tight with all those guys uh, to this day. The last eels tour I did was 2018. So, Oh, nice. Uh huh. Yeah. yeah. And I, so, uh, and then that led to, you know, eels were uh, done touring just as where have all the cowboys gone hit by Paula Cole mm-hmm. and uh, Carter basically just gave me that gig as well. And, you know, that was a rocket ride for three years. Yeah. So what was and, that like just starting off? And uh, was that a U.S. tour or they were just touring the U.S. at that point early? My very first, my well, Paula had me fly to and from New York uh, just for an interview. Um it was the first time I'd ever done that where I just flew from Austin to New York, talked to somebody for an hour and flew home that day. That was not something I had wow. ever experienced at that point in my life and seemed like yeah. very rock and roll and very cool. And I was super excited. Right. Um, but her first tour date with me was actually in Scotland at King Tut's Wawa Hut. Um, hmm. I had just finished an Eels tour 12 hours earlier and right. one tour bus dropped me off. The Eels tour bus dropped me off at, some hotel in London and I finished the tour itinerary for Paula. I climbed on the new tour bus, drove up to Scotland, met her at the airport and away we went. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So that's pretty, wor- that's, that's pretty whirlwind. I mean, yeah. um, how big was the, the whole eels operation, for example, like comparing to what you're, what you're looking at with a Wilco? I mean, um, you know, how I, and cause, uh, and obviously you have to juggle so many challenges and you're clearly, you know, an on, on your feet kind of by the moment, uh, problem solver, which is, uh, really what you, uh, have to specialize as in a tour manager. I mean, you said yourself, you've got to be five steps ahead of everybody else. Um, what are kind of those, some of those lessons that came into play early on when in your first tour managing experience with Eels? Um, what, well, as far as Eels versus Wilco goes, it was very, very different. Two completely different eras of music and two different styles of mm-hmm. management set up in bands. So Eels are at a time when DreamWorks is the is a huge label and Eels was the first band they'd signed. They'd signed, I want to say George Michael as a solo artist or something, but Eels were the first band. The money yeah. was flowing. Yeah. The checks were being written. Checks right. like that don't get written now on any level in any way for tour support. So it was business class over to London. And it was my first experience with getting a band in a van and having girls chase it down the street. And (laughs) it was a gargantuan leap from, you know, the very important lessons I learned with Jimmy Del Gilmore, James McMurtry, um, you know, all those Austin singer songwriters, uh, all that really important stuff. I, I kind of refer to my time in Austin with those people as triple A ball. Uh, because it really honed my skills. And then I was lucky enough to get called up to the show. To the majors. Um, yeah. And I also walked into a really great situation because they were a young band uh, as well at that time without a ton of touring experience. So any deficiencies I had were kind of hidden by the fact that I was already an upgrade for them. And yeah. so it's another right. experience of still learning on the job. I certainly wasn't right. fully, I certainly wasn't fully formed as a tour manager by that point. So. Yeah, or maybe they didn't know what they were. They couldn't get on you really hard. It's like so that's a positive and uh, yeah, you know. just so the fact that did... I had an itinerary. Like I had, you know, we we call them the book of lies, but back in the day, we had printed itineraries, like a month or two months worth of printed itineraries at a time. Right. You know, uh, now that's all done on an app on your phone. It's super easy, uh, and you can Google the distance between point A to point B. But you, none of those tools were there back then, right? Yeah. So you really in a way. In a way, if you're you're operating a bigger operation right now, but in a way, have things gotten kind of easier because of the automation, because of apps, because of you know the advances in communication, et cetera? Absolutely, without a question. I mean, I started this job with a 
you know, MCI calling card, a pager and a legal pad and a pen. Um, <laughs> I remember that. And, I remember MCI calling cards. <laughs> and you would get a 911 page on your pager and you tell the bus driver to pull over to a truck stop and you hit a right. pay phone and find out what went wrong. And it could be anything from really bad news to, Hey, there's an interview I need you to schedule. It could be anything. Um, right. and, and now that's ubiquitous and instantaneous, whether it be text, email or whatever. Um, and the expectation is that you're available 24 hours a day, uh, back then as it, as it is today. Yeah. So <laughs> even more so today, even more so today, you know, you don't respond to a text on, on the road today to an artist or musician within, you know, three or four minutes, you get a series of question marks, you know, like, yeah, where yeah, are you, yeah. where are you and why haven't you, thought, you responded to me? So, right. So it's easier, but it's harder. Yeah. It, re it requires more instantaneous response. Um, how is that kind of fashioned the way that you approach uh, the job of logistics and movement and travel and venues? I have a couple mottos. Uh, probably my most important one is run to your problems. Uh, I believe in run aggressively. To, run to your problems? Run yeah. to your right. problems. I, I think running to your problems is the, simply the most important thing you can do. Don't ever look at something and be afraid of it and be afraid to address it. Get to it. Get to mm -hmm. it right away. Even if you can't solve it in the moment. It's okay to run up to a problem and say, hey, I see you. How are you? I'm going to get back to you in 20 minutes. But you can't right. just let it fester. The longer you let it fester, the worse it gets. And that's just a universal truth. At least it has been for me. Yeah, um, absolutely. And then it's preparation, preparation, preparation. It's advancing. You, know? you have to have done all of your work well in advance so that when you walk into a venue on that day, you already know how the day is going to play out and you've already game plan for the 10, 20, 30 or 40 things that are going to go wrong. You know, whether this is a union hall that has an asshole steward, or, you know, if this is a union hall that has a guy that's really cool, that's going to work with you. You know that this promoter rep uh, is someone you've had issues with in the past or not, you know, you just, those are all things that come from time on right. the road. What does a typical kind of day look like? I mean, not a typical, like what is a, it's not a, never really a typical day, but what does kind of, okay, this is a show day. It, when does the show day begin? Does it begin when the, the prior, let's say you were playing in a, in a, in a city the night before you've got like, you're, you're, you're stacked with one night and then the next night, when does everything in the preparation start? What does that look like from when? the venue uh, went for, sorry, from when the show ends the night before until you get on stage, sort of. So when the show ends the night before, uh, the day ends for me when I know that the band's all on board and safe. Um, and let's just mm -hmm. say roughly, let's just say that's 1 a.m. or whatever. Uh, yeah, and yeah. then load in the next day's eight. So you have seven hours in between, you know, when you're done and when you begin again. Uh, for me, the next day starts as soon as I get into my bunk, um, and I uh, will game plan the morning right away in my head. Eve, not the whole day, then just the first couple hours, try to, you know, like, all right, this is a venue where the bus is parked close. This is a venue where the bus parks far. This is a venue where I, I'll just try to put together whatever I have from my notes in the advance or whatever. And I'll do just mm -hmm. a sort of quick assessment. And then I'm going to do everything I can to turn my brain off and get some sleep. Um, right. That's another it's thing. One, it's, your, it's already 1 a.m. You guys have just, you guys have left the venue. The loadout is all complete. Yep. And uh, you don't leave before loadout is complete, right? No, very rarely. Sometimes the band needs to get down the road. Wilco is in a very fortunate situation where we have an amazing wheel crew. Um, yep, I see that. I like that shirt. That's pretty and, cool. And I have the luxury of trusting everybody. So if it's a show and go for the band for some reason, then I can get the band on the bus and go and knowing that everything is going to be fine. A show and go, I'm assuming means they, they do the show, you finish and you're gone. The hot out. Just Elvis has left the it's kind of like the distance, uh, right? The distance, be, this, what governs that just different logistical factors, the distance to the next venue, et cetera. Yeah. There could be something as easy as press in the morning, or there's just like some weird factor going on. My personal preference is always to keep the entourage together. It's a lot easier to deal with a bus breakdown. If there's buses are together, you know, you give yourself some options, uh, but there are times when the band has to has to move forward or maybe right. it's, you know, a day off and the band's like, oh, we love the town we're going into and we want to be there early. Could be as simple as that or it could be some logistical yeah. need. Right. Um, do you get do does everyone sleep on the bus or do you 
rent? Do, do, do you have a hotel on the other end to get some sleep when you get there? Or how does that kind of work out? I always wonder that. So typically you only have hotel on days off. Uh, every artist and band is different, um, but you're going to get most of your sleep on the bus. If you're trying to check into a hotel, grab a few hours of sleep and then get back on, it, it really interrupts and divides up the day and, and doesn't work. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the best thing to do is is to get into your bunk, try to find a way to turn your brain off and uh, and right. sleep as best you can. And that's where you're at the mercy of a great bus driver. And hopefully that uh, you're not on the part of I-95 on the East Coast that hasn't paid its taxes or done its road work in 30 years. <laughs> Tons of potholes, or at yeah. least the shocks are good on the bus, hopefully. Yeah. So you've Dri- got drivers into- are important. Yeah, absolutely. Right. I mean, don't, <laughs> that's an understatement, right? I mean, yeah. I'm sure you've got some, what's a story when the driver has not been that great? Like how bad can that go? <laughs> it can be, it can be bad enough that it can affect a show. It is so bad that yeah, no one got right. sleep and is miserable and are upset or there's a personality conflict. I've had drivers who think that they're a part of the band and, you know, maybe have a drivers tend to have a slightly different political take than bands. That's a stereotype, but it's a pretty true stereotype. Um, and then all of a sudden something, this person that has your life in their hands, you have a combative relationship with, um, that's uncomfortable and bad. Um, you know, uh, there's all kinds of stuff that can happen without, you know, dining anybody out. But anyway. Right. Right. That's crazy. So you're, you're on the bus, you, you've, you're, you, you've kind of game plan the next day, et cetera. Some of the highlights, you try to get some sleep and you get to the venue kind of then what, what kind of goes down from that point? Uh, pop up in the morning. You know, I pride myself in trying to be one of the first, if not the first, into the building. Uh, you know, grab my kind of go bag of you know that day's clothes and and uh, toiletries and get in. Say hi to everyone. Get a lay of the land. Figure out what's what. Try to find uh, a shower that has a locking door if you're lucky. <laughs> yeah. uh, get your shower. Get your shower in right away as fast as you possibly can because the second people identify you as tour manager. You're only going to get two You're or three assailed. steps every time without someone. Yeah. yeah. So you, you and you've <laughs> got mean, to find the time like, for yourself. Yeah. Sorry. Making sure that no, no, making sure there's a lock on the shower door is kind of a that's a commentary on the job itself, really, right? <laughs> it's a big deal. It doesn't happen. I mean, Fuck. sometimes they're arena shower, locker room style showers, and it's not that you know, but you some you just need a moment of privacy. Uh, yeah, well, a, I mean, away from know. people that are going to be, yeah, once they identify you as tour manager, they're like, uh, yeah, you want to, you're, I know you're shampooing your hair, but, uh, we got an issue. <laughs> yeah, no, they'll come right to you. And that's the job. But at the same time, you got to find that 15 minutes and you can't luxuriate in it, but, right. um, but there's usually you try to catch a shower at the venue. I mean, yeah. with, and with, with Wilco, you're playing big enough venue. So that's, that's, that's an option. Most, I, most I, places have figured that out unless you're on a really small van tour uh, most venues have figured out how important the shower is and, uh, that's much more available to touring acts than it used to be. Wilco, I mean, we're an embarrassment of riches. It's the greatest job I've ever had. The venues are fantastic. People are happy to see us, you know, it's it's really awesome. Yeah. I mean, with the scale of Wilco, it's like a, it's a, it's a touring juggernaut. I mean, how, what does that look like for you? Are you, you said it's an embarrassment of riches. I mean, what's something that's happened recently where you're like, God, I remember those days when I first started back with the eels and like, this is crazy. Like, I mean, it's, it's every day just walking in and seeing people smile, you know, like, Hey, yeah. they're happy you're here. Cause I've been Wilco's TM now for six years. Uh, uh-huh. But a lot of goodwill was built up before me. It's not like, it's not like anyone slacked before me. Interesting. Um, you know, I people think people are happy uh, to see Wilco. People are happy to see Wilco, and that's that's fortunate. You're not going around repairing any kind of bad relationships or or anything like that. Um, uh, you just walk in, and there's just a sense. I I'm so spoiled with the Will crew and with the band. I am never worried about any single person in the entire Wilco entourage, whether it be the newest member of the team to Jeff himself. I'm never worried for one moment that that person is going to do anything else, but bring it 100%. Um, And I'm really proud of that. And I'm not saying people don't have bad moments or bad days or melt down on people. Um, I certainly do. I'm sure if you asked around, there are some stories, Um, but that's not my philosophy. You know, I I really, really, really try hard to go in with a positive attitude. Um, When there is a problem, the goal is to look for a solution and not assess blame. Um, Mm -hmm. I think people who, I think 
some people have a tendency to create a problem and then ride in on a horse to solve it. I don't believe in that. I don't like that. Um, I want to walk in. I want to have it nailed. I want to know it's going to be okay because stuff happens. Chain motors get left off the truck, um, you know, by the local vendor. It happens. There's no malice intended. There's no point in getting mad about it. You need to put all that stuff to the side solve the problem. And then you can be like Yosemite Sam in the old commercials. You can walk outside and lose your effing mind. Right. Uh, right. And then you can come back in and then you're calm again. But in the moment, you've got to keep that together. Yeah. It's a, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a unique ability to objectively approach a problem, not assign blame and find, try to find the solution as quickly as possible. And trust your people. Sometimes you're not the one that has the best idea on how to solve the problem. Right. Um, I tend well, to think I you, am. So that, that kind of begs another question that I was, I wanted to ask, what sort of interface do you have with other people that you could bounce like an issue off? Is it kind of an ad hoc, you know, you're, who are you the closest with in terms of position and how so does the, that hierarchy work? The brain trust of Will Crew, in my mind, uh, is myself, our production manager, Jared Dodarelli, uh, mm-hmm. our stage manager, Ashwin Dipankar, and uh, uh, Wilco's assistant tour manager, uh, Ashley Pocketknife. Magazel, we call her PK. Um, <laughs> and uh, those are the four people that I'm going to circle up from a crew perspective and and drag in and say, hey, how do we solve this? You know, Jared, this is an audio problem. It's falling more in your world. Or, hey, I'm sorry, Ashwin. I know we'd much rather prefer to have a solo acoustic act and we only have four state feet of space, but we've got a 17 piece band coming. You've got to figure it out. Um, and that happens, you know, and, yeah. and it's not our job to tell the band they can't have who they want to open or whatever it is. It's your job to sort it out and you need to do it and you need to do it with a positive attitude because it's just going to go faster. It's just going to go better. And I'm just, like I said, I'm really lucky to have a team that does it. Um, and a team that doesn't coddle me either, you know, um, pocket knife has no fear to tell me I'm wrong and it's great. Right. Yeah, yeah, those it's good to surround people with surround surround yourself with people that don't necessarily give the answer that that you want. Um, yeah, it's important. And so these all these people are traveling with you as well, like in a different yeah. bus. Uh, are you are you in the Wil- same Wil- bus? Will goes a, yeah. a two bus tour. It's me uh-huh. and the six band members on one bus, and then uh, the ten members of the Will crew on the other bus. And then we're a one semi truck tour most of the time, depending if we're going out of bigger places. Maybe maybe we have more than one truck, but we try for budget purposes to try to keep everything into a single semi truck. But it would just be like one truck for an entire tour, or would there be like a different venue where you have to bring in other things? And what kind of other things would you bring that 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 fill a second semi tractor trailer huge eighteen wheel thing? So one thing that's changed in the last sort of 10 years of touring is um, audio has gotten really, really great and lighting's gotten really, really great. Mm-hmm. Um, so you don't have to rely on bringing your own stuff to know that you're going to have quality equipment. So we tend to travel with control, which means we have our own lighting consoles and maybe we have some lights of our own um, and then our own set pieces. And then we travel with audio control as well, which means we have our own consoles and we have our own monitors. But then all the other stuff we're going to bring in locally. Um, and that is what saves us from having to carry uh, a second truck or a third truck. Um, oh, okay. And what's vendor- the other stuff? Uh, so just it's Usually. sound and lighting. You just like, you know, people don't really realize how much truck space that stuff takes up. You see the big yeah, speakers yeah. flying on either side. Um, they look small know, from far away. <laughs> right. But it's, it, you know, it's a truck or two worth of stuff. Yeah. Um, and there was a time when you just couldn't trust that anything locally was going to be good enough. Um, and that's not the case anymore. Uh, you know, there's four or five manufacturers and also just like anything else in the world, um, things have gotten consolidated or, you know, all under one roof. So, you know that, Oh, Hey, this is an eight day audio PA and eight day does the audio for these 10 sheds and these five theaters. And you know, walking in that you're in great shape. Or this and is a solid clear and amazing. So you figure out all that ahead of time. Like I'm going to this venue. What's the sound? How much do we have to bring? What do we have to worry about or not worry about? Oh, interesting. So it kind of becomes a little bit more consolidated because there's great sound in different houses, for example. Absolutely. And and we work hard on the advance. So we lay everything yeah, out sure. in advance. We are like, Oh, you mean clear. you don't do this on the bus the night before? <laughs> we don't. Uh, and that's a lesson people have to learn, you know, because, yeah. There can be, I don't know, this is the part of, this is the part of the interview where I'm the old man on my 
porch yelling at the kids to get off my lawn. Um, Cause I feel like some young tour managers don't understand how easy they, they have it um, yeah. uh, with when I was Matt. your age. Yeah. And, and it's fine, but I wonder if they understand the logistics of it as well as they had had to figure out all that stuff. And so well, just if you could, if you could choose it. one, yeah. If you could choose one thing from now, that you'd like to have had back then, what would be, what's that key element that it's would have made the ma- it's like, master. It's the master tour app by Eventric. Absolutely. The master tour app. Yeah. It's, it's industry standard at this point. There are others out there, but that's the one. Um, I'm user number zero, zero three, I think. Oh, seriously. If, if oh, early adopter. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, I adopted technology early on. I mean, I, Right. I almost wish I had it. I had this James Bond looking like thing of phone adapters because every single country had a different phone adapter. So in the days of AOL dial up, you'd have to be able to have an adapter for Italy, for Ireland, for the UK, yeah, yeah. for Spain, for Germany, you know, and that's another thing that's changed back then. I had to have 20, you know, folders cause I had to have Lira and Gilders and Kroners and Franks and right. You know, all that's changed. You know, there's not nearly as much of that now because you just right. have. Okay, the so that's two things. So it's the the app, and now Sorry. we're talking about currency. But yeah. still, I mean, yeah, so. the currency thing I hear a lot about. The, it's just way easier now that it's on a on the, the the common European market. So yeah, so um, much easier. But yeah, oh, totally. I can't even imagine. It's hard as an individual. <laughs> just a lot of organization and a lot of folders and a lot of paper. It used to be yeah. right, but and been, less paper now been, too. It, just yeah, oh, you, yeah. You overall, don't... overall, even, yeah, yeah, you just pay whatever. Yeah, it, right. It says in my advance right now that do not bring hard copies of settlement to me. If you kill a tree by printing out an ad pack, I'm going to lose my mind. Um, you know, ad pack? I don't need it. An ad What's... pack is proof that the promoter spent the money on the advertising they say they spent. All right. Oh, and the way God. that was done back in the day was they would photocopy every single ad they placed in the newspaper or a music rag <laughs> and a photocopy of every single receipt that they bought from the radio station or whatever. And you would, I would only need that if the show had sold poorly and hadn't expected to, or, but it's not something I need all the time. And it's certainly, I don't, something I want printed out. Um, and I'm not going to carry it around. I'm going to throw it in the trash can as we leave because it's going to answer my question one way or the other. Yeah. You know, you didn't spend the money, you didn't do your job. And then I'm on the phone with the agent and I'm going to let him take it from there. And you're going to be really sorry. Um, or everything's great. And, Oh, I do want a copy of this ad because it looks great. I'm going to show it to the artist, but all that can be done electronically. Yeah, of course. Of course. And the app that you were saying that you wish you had had, which begs a lot of questions about like that, the technology just wasn't ready at that point, et cetera. But tell me about this app and how that helps make your life easier. Well, it's instantaneous. So in the day, like I told you, we had the Book of Lies, uh, which was an <laughs> itinerary. And it was called that because I would literally have to create 30 to 45 days worth of touring and put it into a book ready to go. And you that meant every hotel had to be right. Every phone number had to be right. Uh, back in the day, you didn't have cell phones. So you had to know the number of the production office of the venue you were going to. That had to be right. They couldn't be off by one digit. Um so many things could could go wrong with that. And now with yeah. Master Tour and also just technology, um, you can instantly get a notification out to somebody. You can instantly update the schedule. Um, I used to spend right. so much of my time uh, typing up a day sheet, printing it out, walking through the hotel, slipping it under doors. Um, none of that happens anymore. You know, so this is an pro- integrated project management system that yeah. like will zap emails to everybody according to your list or texts or whatever, and then just... Yeah. So of course it's, and it's on their phone too. That's now it's kind of great because sort of the responsibility is sort of fallen to the user. Like they can't yell at me for not slipping a day sheet under the door because all they have to do is pick up their phone and they can see the most recent information. Right. Wow. You know, so it's great. It's really great. It's huge. I mean, it's huge. Yeah. I mean, that's obviously made your life easier. What's like the, the, the one thing that you, is that the one thing you couldn't live without? What is that thing? Boy, that's the one thing I would not want to give up that and uh, the ability. I mean, I cannot begin to tell you how much easier it is to deal with a bus breakdown with a cell phone than it was oh. in the days of trying to wave somebody down, get to a truck stop. You know, those the right. communication overall is the number one thing, right? And that everything falls under that, whether that's cell phones and texting all the way down to the master tour, because that's still communication. And the right. ability to communicate so quickly and so instantaneously. Um, that's a double-edged sword I'll take all the time, even though it means I might get woken up at four o'clock in the morning because they can. 
um, I'll take right. that yeah. versus yeah. There's the downside. You can always put you, you can put your phone on silent, but the fact of the matter is that it's great to be able to get yourself out of situations. I mean, you know, uh, without being turning this around and becoming like an exercise in gratitude, for example, but there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, uh, it makes no, but I'll, a hell I'll tell of you this easier. There's no world where I can, I would feel comfortable on the road to put my phone on silent. Oh, um, fuck no. Yeah. You know, uh. there's just no way there's just no way. And as a tour manager, you learn, you know, you can tell by the way the bus stops, whether it's pulling in to get fuel or because you've broken down, you know, yeah. and your body pops open immediately. And that's just another life on how the road many, thing. How many times has a bus broken down? I mean, it happens two or three times a year. Oh, you know, so it's a pretty there. common occurrence that these things just like. Yeah, I mean, you know, they're doing hundreds of thousands of miles a year. Uh, you know which companies do a better job of maintaining. Sometimes you can't do anything about it. Um, I'm pretty lucky. I mean, I think for as much time as I spend on the road, uh, the bus breakdown that's affected a show is, mm, I've never had a show not go because of a bus breakdown. I've had yeah. to pull off some crazy stuff to make that happen. Yeah, like, um, what? like what? You know, uh, like sending the crew bus back for the band. You know, I was like, okay, clearly this band bus is broken down. I can't uh, delay the crew bus any longer. You guys get to the venue, get going without me. I trust everyone. Everyone knows how to do their job. Mr. Bus driver, I'm really, really sorry. I'm going to give you a lot of extra money, but I'm going to need you to turn around and come get us, you know, in time to get the band picked up and on the stage. And this just happened last year with, with Wilco. And, you know, we got to the stage as the support act was walking off the stage. We had 30 minutes to, you know, to get off the bus and get ready to go. But, you know, like I said, I have the embarrassment of Wilco uh, riches. Um, and those guys walked off, picked up their cement and just crushed it, you know? Wow. Nice. What city was but that? It happens. Yeah. That was that on the way to Birmingham, on the way to Birmingham, Alabama. <laughs> wow. Wow. Yeah. So you pulled, you, you pulled that one off. I mean, that's kind of speaks to, you know, deal with the issues as they come up. Um, how did the embarrassment of riches help you at that point? Like how did the, the your available resources and um, that resources are made available to you ha help at that point? Um, I think not just the fact that Wilco is so well loved, but also I take up your amount of pride, the relationships I've built through the years. Mm -hmm. um, I can get the head of senators or the main person I need at senators on the phone. I have their cell phone number. <laughs> um, and uh, that's a matter of trust because I don't abuse it, right? I'm not calling yeah, right, them to exactly. say that so-and-so didn't clean the bus well enough. You know, yeah. I'm calling them. If they if they see a call from me, they know there's a problem and that I need help. Um, right. I so don't waste call? people's time. So I called, you know, the main person, my main contact at senators and said, here's what's going on. Here's what we need. Um and this particular case was a, you know, a, a bigger breakdown than any of us thought. And that just happens. Sometimes it's a hose and you're going to be back on the road in an hour and a half. The little truck comes from the service company and changes out the hose, fills you up with radiator fluid and you're on your way. Other times it's something serious. Yeah. This was the time that was serious, but the company was all in. Uh, they stayed with me on the phone and took all my calls and, you know all that kind of stuff. But if you're a band that treats your drivers badly or doesn't pay their bills or is arrogant or anything like that, I believe that stuff comes back to bite you. Um, well, yeah. If you're not paying somebody that usually comes back to bite you for sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's not even, or act like a dick to people. Yeah. I mean, I, just like yeah, treat I people think, the way you want to be treated and you get the best yeah. performance out of people in general, like with respect, no matter what yeah. they're, and that's, you know. that's a learned thing too. I wasn't that way to start uh, that. I put a very stark dividing line in my career at the year 2000, um, I, I had spent 10 months on the road for five years straight. I was a shell of a person physically and mentally. I'd just come mm. off a really, really, really hard tour. I won't say who the artist was, but it was the most difficult tour of my life and still stands as it. I didn't wow. want to see a tour bus or anything ever again. And I woke up every morning extremely angry. And at one point I just went, I just don't want to be this angry ever anymore, ever again. And I really changed my approach to well what was the job. things that made that so bad and i'd be remiss if i didn't ask you if you would tell me to say that you can't say the name of the band well <laughs> if you're standing at the bottom of a hill catching shit all day um you're not going to be a happy person you know and if if you're working for a toxic person who's going through a bad time 
um, then that falls to you. And if you're constantly getting yelled at or being held responsible for whims or things that you can't control, then you turn around and you take it out on others. Um, and learning to let all that stuff just go through you instead of in you, uh, is, a is really hard. It's really hard. It's hard to be in the room and have the artist completely dressing you down and oh, realize yeah, that, that this isn't about me. This is about them. They just found out that their record didn't chart and their track record is always charted. Or they right. just found out that the place they used to play in this town, they're now playing a place that's a third of the size or, you know, and that's not you, that's yeah. them. But I mean, is that kind of a learned quality? That's an excellent yeah. quality to have. I mean, it's is that something you've, yeah, you've learned that over the years that you seem like you can deal with problems on the fly, which is an integral part of what your job description is clearly, but also have the ability not to place blame and not like, let's solve the problem. Don't try to assign blame. Yeah. It's a learned. It's and understand learned, where, understand and where things are coming from and what the source is. Yeah. It's learned. And it took me a long time to learn it. And I learn it yeah, every day right. over and over again too. Like it's a great it's, skill to have just in general. Yeah. And you need to, you're, you're going to learn it every day. Something's going to happen. Your initial re instinct is going to just go off on this person and they may even deserve it. Um, <laughs> yeah. but, um, I learned long ago, I'm much more, more effective when I can take a deep breath and speak calmly because when I lose it, I just look like, Bluto from the old Popeye cartoons of the thirties and forties, <laughs> right, you know, right, I'm a right. big guy. And if I, a big guy starts yelling and screaming with long hair, I just right. look like a caricature. And then, um, I didn't actually accomplish anything except make myself look like an idiot. Yeah. Make somebody it takes else like mad way longer to come. It takes way longer to come down off of that than it does to like generate. And then all that energy yeah. that's generated. Um, so you're, you're, it, and that doesn't make you any, serious or effective it just it actually makes you more effective i think young tms think they have to yell and scream um and yeah. that's how they get taken seriously but it's actually the opposite right sometimes i've learned from some conflict resolutions in my life that sometimes you know just to speak softly but firmly and try not to get angry is you get good attention that way especially if your words can be effective and people yeah. listen they're way yeah. more apt to listen if you're not getting fully pissed at them Although you For might sure. be, yeah, it's also more satisfying. Again, it's also more satisfying. I mean, we, <laughs> to be able to tell somebody exactly what the fuck's going on instead of just screaming and chewing people out. There's a time and place for that. There was a festival. Somebody, yeah, uh, I'll give one story without mentioning any names. It was a Wilco tour, but I won't say what the festival was. Um, it was a festival that had good sized artists on it. The night before Weezer had played, and the night that Wilco was playing, Wilco was headlining. Um, forget who played right before us, but it was somebody decent, Jenny Lewis, or I don't know. Um, mm -hmm. And I uh, woke up and I just could not believe the condition of the festival site. This was a real deal festival with real deal acts. And I went to the, the dressing room area and they had one porta potty that hadn't been cleaned out or sucked out from Weezer the night before. <sighs> um, and I walked into the production and I asked a few questions and it was clear that they had no intention of doing anything about it. And that, you know, uh, I, I fully launched on that person. Um, <laughs> and I don't feel bad about it now. And I didn't feel bad about it then because there are appropriate right. moments to do that. But I do remember screaming that you don't invite a band like Wilco and not give them a place to shit. Yeah. <laughs> right. And people don't understand. You can't poop on the bus. You can't do They don't understand how important it is to have a place just to do something like go to the bathroom. Their plan for going to the bathroom was to put you in a golf cart and take you to the church that was three blocks away. That's not how going to the bathroom works. No. Um, <laughs> you know? Uh, and so there are times yeah. where you just have to put your foot down and you know, lo and behold, there was a really nice right. toilet trailer there two hours later. And sometimes that happens. Other times. Right, so there are, there are times when we're dealing with bodily functions, you got to get pissed. Or just notwithstanding our prior, notwithstanding our prior conversation about calm <laughs> conflict resolution, don't fuck with <laughs> your shitting in a porta potty. I mean, would you like to wake up in the morning and have no place to go to the bathroom? I mean, no, it's just, dude, uh, I'm just, it's, I'm making, I'm no, making I'm, light I'm just, of it. Just because I think it's a no, that's, no, that's I totally I, agree with you. People laugh all the time. They read rock and roll writers and they think we're ridiculous and everything like that. It's like, hey, man, like we don't, we can't go down the road to the grocery store. 
There's yeah. no, like, you know, we don't go to our refrigerator and there's something magically there because someone shopped for us or whatever. So, you know, all this stuff matters. And, you know, creating that environment for the artists and the crew matters. It's going to help the show. It's going to, you know, people tend to think yeah. that that's a diva thing, but it's the farthest thing from the truth. That well, it goes back to also the advances in like in venues and being also with a larger being able to like, get in there and take a shower and like all that stuff that you there are certain baseline things that you need as necessities to be close to be able to operate on that kind of level. Yeah, for sure. Right, for right, sure. right. Those common frustrations that, you know, if you got to go and there's not a clean place to go. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, people so. put up with it when they're fans, but <laughs> yeah. the talent shouldn't have to put up with shit like that. I mean, not to mix, not to mix metaphors. Yeah. But so, yeah. you know, you pick your battles and so you're going to have those moments. And also I'm human and I've gone off on somebody because I was having a bad day, you know, yeah. and then yeah, you try yeah, to, re- sure. you try to repair that either at the end mm-hmm. of the night or, or next time around. But you know, everyone's yeah. human. Uh, everyone's sure. human. I'll just leave it at that. Yeah. Um, you talked about how, um, and it's well known in the industry, how professional the Wilco operation is for sure. Um, and how much does that, um, to personal connections with the band? I mean, you're on the bus with these guys, right? How much is that and those type of good relationships that you can develop uh, over time and um, having a band that's professional, having experience at their back, uh, being somewhat older, um, how much does that play into making your job much easier? And what are the factors about that? Uh, it's, it's everything. And uh, we talked earlier about being at the bottom of the hill and catching stuff as it rolls down the hill. Yeah. Um, but I'm extraordinarily lucky because I'm with a, an organization that doesn't throw stuff down the hill um, from top to bottom. Um, Without a question, Jeff Tweedy gets it and is involved more than any artist I've ever been around ever. Uh, He has high standards, but he gives you the tools. He gives you the space um, and he lets you do your job. And his manager does the same thing. They trust you. They say, here are the parameters that you need to work with. And, you know, here's the here's the tour budget here's what we have. And then they get out of the way and they give you the the keys to do that, but they don't abandon you either. So if you turn around and say like, Hey, I'm hitting this wall on this thing, there's a resource for help there. You're not left alone. And that's, uh, that's not something, trust me, that is not something that happens. There are some managers who are more concerned about managing their fantasy baseball team than getting back to you where you wait three or four days for a simple decision about a t-shirt design. So the that respect not, and professionalism yeah. kind of extends throughout the entire organization. Absolutely. Jeff's and manager it, included. It starts with Jeff though. It's, it's the, it starts with him and the band. Um, they, they treat everybody with respect. He just does. Um, yeah. Well, he's a no, he doesn't pull any punches. He's an, you know, he's such an honest and open individual. I don't even know him personally. And I just know from things that he says on stage and things that I read about him and just the way that he conveys himself and yeah. communicates, I would be shocked if it were anything different. Yeah. And once again, I've made him mad. I've been on the bus and taken a 20 minute dress down from Jeff Tweedy. And that's okay because it's not coming at a place of being a diva or it's not coming from a place of just making me jump through hoops to see if I can jump around. Um, It comes from a real honest place of wanting the show to be better uh, and expecting things to be better. And that I will take all day long. But when you're asked to do something just to see if you can do it because someone wants to sort of treat you like their hired monkey, that's, that's no good, but I'll work 29 hours a day for somebody like Jeff. Yeah. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. When there's no, Yeah. 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 When there's no end to it. No, I mean, yeah, I was just speaking um, of how the professional, your personal relationships with these guys helps you in your role as, as the tour manager. Yeah, it absolutely does. And um, I've also learned that um, trying to think the best way to say this uh, was it uh, in animal farm uh, all animals are created equal, but some animals are created more equal than others. <laughs> right. Um, but as a tour manager, maybe you know that, but that's not how you need to treat everybody. 
Like maybe there is somebody who's more important than another person, maybe, but do not approach your job in that way. Make sure you're taking care of everybody. Um, and if the artist you're working with is secure enough, they're not going to worry about, you know, how you're treating other people. Um, do you mean other people or other band members? That, it can be other band members. Higher, it can be other crew members. There's, there's hierarchies that are within there's, a band, obviously, right? Absolutely, there's hierarchies, but that doesn't mean that, um, once again, it's hard to talk about with Wilco because everyone's really treated uh, in just an amazing way, but uh, without mm -hmm. naming any other bands, you know, just because the bass player is the guy who gets kicked around the most doesn't mean you should kick him around <laughs> too. Right. right? right. Um, and b maybe by just showing that person like the smallest amount of kindness and making sure the runner does pick up his Q-tips, you know, or whatever it is, yeah. like you'd be amazed at what that pays out down the road later. Um, right. And I think it's a mistake. I've seen tour managers, you know, separate and divide from the herd, cut people from the herd and say, oh, I'm going to take the lead singer and I'm going to pit him against everybody else. And that way I'm going to make sure I keep my job. And I think that's a mistake, you know, but that's my own personal philosophy. It's that's some hard psychological warfare. That's just not, not nice. I can't imagine how that is, is, is been, would be beneficial in the long haul, something like that. Yeah. So you don't seem like you're that kind of, that you would do that. Not anymore. No, <laughs> so you have. I think you just have some survival instincts early on and you're learning, you know? I just right. like I say, I I learn more every day on this job. I'm fifty two. I've been doing it since I was twenty three. Mm -hmm. Um and I have plenty to go, you know, but it, that's what makes it fun. Uh, you know, there is a rote aspect to the day, but yeah. uh, at the same time, it's a different person every day, you know. It, the schedule may be the same, but you're going to walk in. There's going to be a different personality. There's going to be different challenges. It could be something as easy as the catering sucks that day. Uh, so we're going to deal with getting the runner to go out and get some buyouts. Or it can be, right. you know, some super heavy, uh, a tornado just came through. Or we have to evacuate right. the festival site. Or, you know, it right. just goes from everything. And sometimes yeah. the small stuff matters. And I often joke that the bigger the problem is, the calmer I get. If the batteries aren't working in the remote, in the hotel room, I can lose my mind. But right, it's just if like you come one to of those me, things you got to chase it down. It's kind of a, you lose your mind because it is such a small thing. And it's like, this was so fucking easy. Now I've got right. to run around and make a three phone calls for fucking batteries, which I didn't want to do. Right. Right. But at but least you, you have the satisfaction when it's a large problem that, Oh shit, I better fucking hunker down, man. This to put yeah. the game. It's time to get serious. If you come to me five minutes before showtime and tell me the entire monitor system has crashed, then it's like, okay. You know, how are we going to, how are we going to fix this? How are we gonna Dude, I this? totally, I totally relate. This makes me feel so much better about losing my shit. It's not the small things. Yeah, it is. <laughs> totally the small things during this pandemic, during this pandemic, I can handle the pandemic. I can handle all that. But my poor wife watched me melt down because the storage containers and storage lids didn't match. I was like, you know, how the hell do we have five round containers and one round lid? Well, you know, and, and that's what I lost up, my mind over, not yeah, over the fact over. that. Yeah, but blowing up over the small shit sometimes an indicator that the you sh maybe you could have gotten not meaning you personally, but one right. could get a little bit more personally involved in like the bigger problems because you're for sure pushing shit down. That yeah. it's easy just to let the genie back out of the bottle when yeah. shit the, the tiny shit doesn't go wrong. Yeah. Um, you seem very happy with Wilco. I mean, what's the general? What's the vibey feeling like? with them in terms of like when we talk about their professionalism, it's really hard to be on the road, but you're on the road with a major touring band, world famous touring band. Um, they're playing great music. Fans are loving it. Um, what's that kind of vibey feeling like for you? And how does that, um, and is that something that generally gets, uh, is it pervasive on the bus and with the band in general? I think the three greatest words in, in the English language are house lights out. Um, because <laughs> solves, when those, a, solves a lot of problems. Well, no, when those lights snap out and that crowd roars and you yeah. click your flashlight on and you put Wilco on stage. Right. That's a fucking amazing. Sorry. That is an amazing feeling. Dude, you can say whatever. We're not, this is a, not a children's show. That is, that is a feeling that I'm sitting here and I've got goosebumps, you know, and yeah, I haven't put sure. Wilco so on right. stage in nine months. Um, and, and that's been true with every artist I've ever done ever, whether that was somebody walking on 
to, you know, it, 12 people in a club that has all their sports games on the TVs and they're not turning them off. Like, you know, it's, it's an amazing feeling to be able to do that and to be yeah. able to do it with bands like Wilco or calling house lights out with eels that a sold out show at Royal Albert hall or, you know, putting Wilco on stage at Pukle pop in front of 60,000 people or whatever it is. I mean, that's the drug. It's not, any street drug or illegal drug. The drug is right, house lights no. out. The drug is the snap of the lights and the roar of the crowd. And it's addictive and you can have the worst day ever. You could be fighting with a promoter. You could be mad at your crew. You could be getting crap from every which way but loose. And that happens and it gives you that moment of respite. And it's enough to say, I'm going to wake up and do it again tomorrow, no matter how bad your day is. Wow, that's amazing. And obviously the band, that that's that's kind of what drives the whole operation, right? It's just getting out yeah. there, getting it on stage, having lights out, having people be into it, right? I mean, you're bringing yeah. joy. It's an ode to joy. It's <laughs> an ode bringing, to joy. Yeah, that's, <laughs> I, you're, uh, my speech you're I give to new crew members, this is a speech I give new crew members, basically. It's like, they come in, it's like, I need you to bring it every single day. And here's why. And I tell the story of being... 17 or whenever whenever the steel wheels tour was for the rolling stones and uh they were playing the cotton bowl in dallas texas and back in the day back in the 1900s yeah yeah. back in the 1900s uh (laughs) there weren't there wasn't a uh you didn't go online and buy your tickets uh you know sears in this case was the local ticket outlet in lubbock texas and you went and slept on the sidewalk and, you know, I was the first one in through the doors of Sears to buy my Rolling Stones tickets. Yeah. Um, you know, and I was so excited and I went and it was the worst show I ever saw <laughs> in my life. And it was crushing. It was crushing. Why? What and sucked about it for you? It was just, you know, it just it, it was just the worst sounding show I've ever seen. It just didn't work. Um I've seen them since and they're fantastic. So this wasn't about the stones. I don't know if it was a bad day for me, a bad day for them, a bad day for the sound guy, Um, you know, whatever it was, but it was, it was a miserably bad show and I was horribly, horribly disappointed. Um, And I tell them all the time, all the crew members, like you have to bring it every day because this show, this show might be the place where someone meets someone, they fall in love. This might be the show where two people who are on the outs come together and remember why they fell in love. This show might be the show that keeps someone going and not having something end their life the next day because they have it to hold on to. Like, it's important. And I know I'm like raking it up to like this really important thing, but I believe that. I feel that because the crowd gives it back to you. I'm not even on stage. I'm standing off stage. I never want to be on stage. Um, right, right, right. you know, but you can't, you can't phone it in. There's never one day to phone it in. Um, and I won't accept it. I won't accept a, Oh, Hey, half the light rig's not working, but we can do the show without it. Fuck you. Fuck you. Fix it and fix it now. Um, and bring every single thing. If you bring everything you have and something still doesn't work fine, stuff happens. I'm not going to make say it's perfect all the time, always, but right. if you do anything less than bring it a hundred percent, I've got zero time for you. I love um, this. I mean, you're saying basically, and, and you, you started out by saying that this is like a speech you give to I do. New, crew, new crew members. And the, the gist of, from what I'm hearing is shows are fucking important. Yeah. What we're doing for people out there is important. You have no idea what that looks like on a micro level or right. a macro level, but here it, their music, live music creates possibilities uh, creates environments for people to, uh, thrive or to have to them pointed out, uh, things that are going on in their life and given sometimes even given people the strength to go, I can do this in whatever fashion or whatever they're going through in their life. And it just gives people fucking happiness and hope apart from any kind of other problems. I mean, it's a, it's a respite. It can be a respite for people that have a tough life just to get out there and do this show and, you know, you are yeah. bringing it and you're, and you're bringing it to the people. And I could see how, like, cause we're on this video call. I can see that you were getting emotional about talking it is. about it. It matters to me. This, and this is it, like, yeah, this matters to me too. I mean, this is, this, what, this is what it's all about. Yeah. I mean, and I asked the crew guy, like, what made you want to be here? Don't tell me it wasn't, you saw somebody somewhere that you went, holy crap that I want to do that. 
for me, it was at the age of eight and open up Kiss of Life 2 and seeing Peter Chris's Drum Riser and all that stuff that, you know, I was <laughs> yeah. like, wait a second, what's that? Yeah, I got to go yeah. that direction. And oh, then that led sure. to, you know, being a crew guy for the electric gear and seeing Garth Brooks, you know, come in in the morning and help the lighting crew put his lighting rig together. And, you know, like, wait a second, this matters. This isn't something you can just like, wait, wait a second, this matters. And then your own disappointment. Like I mowed so many lawns for those Rolling Stone tickets. I had to basically steal my parents' car to get to Dallas. It's six and a half hours away from Lubbock, you know? Right, right. Um, Well, Garth Brooks had always like said, I remember hearing him talk about shows and he's like, I look up into that last row because I want to like that person was working just as hard to get to that seat. And I want to, you know, everyone's got to get off at the show. Yeah. So I, I get a little on my high horse and I get a little emotional, but it, I do believe it, you know, and I think it informs my work too. So. Yeah. That's beautiful, man. I mean, that's, this is, it's, it's really what it's all about. It's the music and it's the vibe and yeah, I love the bands that you've worked for too. <laughs> I mean, super lucky. I mean, my career is ridiculous. I mean, you know, Wilco, listen to Williams, Eels, and then, you know, James McMurtry, Jimmy Dill Gilmore. I mean, I did stuff with Butch Hancock and Tish, you know, Hosa, uh, Paula Cole, Amanda Ghost, um, Hal Ketchum. Uh, and wow. I'm super proud of like wow. how long my relationships are. Like I mentioned, like, you know, Eels in 97, but I did a tour with them as recently as 2018. I've been yeah. Wilco's tour manager for six years. I was Lucinda's manager, tour manager, sorry, tour manager for nine years, almost 10. Um, wow. Worked with Hal Ketchum for a decade. I take real pride in the length of those relationships. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I can see why people would want to continue to have you aboard. Does Wilco kind of keep you rolling as tour manager, even during these times when no one's touring? Wilco treats me exceptionally well. Um, and uh, I have I, I get excited when I get a call from anyone in Wilco world, even if we're off the road. You know, right, I right. still love it could be Nels Klein asking something about you know, uh, he's having a hard time checking in for his flight for a solo gig going to Europe. I don't care. I love sorting that out for him, you right. know? Uh, so well, yeah, we, I mean, we, the answer were, we is, were talking. To, yeah. What? Sorry, go ahead. No, no. So the answer is, yeah. I mean, they, they, they do. Um, uh, I, I've been extremely lucky. I've been treated very well by every artist I've ever worked for, but Wilco takes it to another level. Like they just make you feel like you're the guy and it's amazing. Right on. Well, we were talking about before we we started was uh, how you live in Austin now and Wilco's uh, home is Chicago and how that can be a good thing or a bad thing. Like you want to get involved with them personally, but then sort of being in a different city allows you to sort of focus on your own life when you're not on tour. Yeah. I mean, you refer to myself as Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Um, And H I D H I D. Well, (laughs) <laughs> the, the, the way it has to work and I'm lucky enough to have a wife and an awesome son who get this is when the door closes and I'm in the car on my way to the airport I'm a tour manager and right. until the car pulls back up to the house and I walk in the front door I'm a tour manager but the second I walk to the front door of the house I am a dad and a husband first and everything mm-hmm. else is going to be second that split is really really important to me that doesn't mean right. you're ignoring one or the other. It just means that my family knows that I'm going to miss birthdays. I'm going to miss anniversaries. Um, and I may not even be able to call home on those days because God knows what's happened. Um, but at the opposite side of that equation is, is no one's expecting me to respond to them in 30 seconds. Uh, you know, once we come home from tour. Uh, and I think space is really important. I joke with my wife all the time that the reason we've been together 30 years is because I've been gone half the time. Um, <laughs> so you really only married for 15. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But I think it's the same with artists too. Like they don't need me. Jeff doesn't need me around all day, every day. Yeah. I mean, he's right. Jeff Tweedy. He's got more going on and can is the single most competent artist I've ever worked with ever, you know, but uh, it's sure great to be there for him when he needs it on the road. And same thing for the rest of the band, you know, yeah. So, um, but but it's important. The separation is important. And I do joke that you don't ever want to live in the city, same city as your artist. And that's not because <laughs> you don't love your artist or anything. But if you're accessible, you're accessible. And if you're not, you're not. And it gives you that little bit of space that lets you be fresh to give them everything you need when you're out on the road and make them number one. Well, the thing I took away from that we were talking earlier, but um, was that you're committed to both. But yeah. be, having that 
sort of physical distance is more of a mental thing where you know, okay, I'm in Austin, it's family time. Um, and I, it sounds like you're so devoted to what you do and want to problem solve that it keeps that distance allows you to the, some of the, uh, just to keep it separate a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's, I think it's really important. And it's also another lesson you need to learn all those things like, Hey, it's okay to eat, right? It's okay not to eat an entire after show pizza. Um, <laughs> it's okay to, it's okay your- to eat an after show pizza too. <laughs> If you need to, <laughs> uh, but it's also okay to be honest with your artist and say, I'm exhausted and I've got to sleep and you need to be able to tell your artist that, and you hopefully have an artist who understands. And if you don't, you might be in the wrong place. Um, and so wh- wh- what are the, what are the lessons like from being on the road so much? What are your kind of big picture, uh, either professional or life lessons that you've gleaned from this amazing professional life that you've led so far? I mean, I I think we sort of touched, I mean, certainly it's run to your problem. So it's always be prepared. Um, It's don't be afraid to take care of yourself. Uh, Don't be afraid to prioritize the things in your life. It's okay to do that. And as long as you communicate that to the people, and if someone's being moved to number two for a little bit of time, tell them why, and then tell them what you're going to do when they're back to number one. They'll get it. They'll understand it. Uh, you know, for the most part and just be confident and just be grateful for every single day. And if there's any question about that, March 12th was the last time I got to put Wilco on stage and never in a million years. When we canceled that tour, we were scheduled everything for November. Never in a million years did I think we would still be sitting here hoping with fingers crossed that we can work in June of 2021. Right. Um, right. So, so don't take it for granted and take care of yourself. Do small things for yourself. I take shit all the time because I drink Starbucks. Um, and you know, I'm in Vienna or someplace that has amazing coffee and I go get a Starbucks, you know, latte and people are like, what, what's wrong with you? And it's like, no, every single thing in my life is different every single day, all <laughs> over the world. If I can find one, I can, start my day with this one thing that I know is going to be exactly the same. It has nothing to do with the fact that Vienna has great coffee. I'm sure they do. That's not what I need. What I need is this 45 seconds of that first sip that allows me to lock in and be ready for the day. And it's okay to take care of yourself, you know, with stuff like that, Yeah. you know, yeah, yeah, and it's the yeah. little, little things. It's the little things. Well, no one, yeah, no one's going to do that stuff for you. And it makes you kind of centers you, grounds you and brings you back. So that's a good lesson to take back to your, to one's own life. Right. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. That's cool. It's the greatest job in the world. You're in charge. You get to tell people what to do. Embrace it. Well, and you get to go to the show every night too, man. I'm envious of that. I would do that. Yeah. Shit. I mean, you know, I, I I have a younger brother who's an amazing guitar player. Um, and, uh, you know, he has a million different guitars and every now and then he'll post a picture of, I got this blah, blah, blah guitar and almost without failure, you know, I'll write back with a picture of, oh, I just upgraded my printer. It's amazing. You know, <laughs> <laughs> and it's kind of the same thing, right? Like, yeah, right. you know, just cause you're a tour manager doesn't mean you can't be a gearhead. You can get excited about, about your printers. tools. You can get excited about your tools, you know, as much as, as anybody else. And, uh, and being on the front edge of that and being as put together production office as you possibly can be like all that stuff that it's a, it's a it's fucking awesome. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, how much do you, when, when the, when the, we talked about when the house lights go down, how much do you get to enjoy the show? It depends. It depends on so many factors. Um, I try to check in without the show throughout. Uh, but lots of times that's the time I get to eat as well. Uh, oh, cause if I try to eat like, when everyone else is eating, I can't get a bite in because I'm asked a bunch of questions. Uh, a lot of other business goes on as well during the show. I'm settling the show, you know, as soon as the box office closes and other things like that going, but I keep a monitor in my office. I'm listening to the show at all times. I always have an ear out to hear something feels like it's going wrong on stage. It does not happen much with Wilco, but every now and then there's a rowdy fan or, you know, somebody who's doing something wrong or a security guy who messed up or, whatever um but you know look if they're if impossible germany's in the set um i don't care what's going on i'm going out to catch nelson solo. <laughs> yeah, right. you know if yeah on and Over on and Nel- on hopefully you're if, on Nell's side at that point well yeah you know always get that luxury but if on and on and on is in the set you know that's my personal favorite all-time wilco song i'm going to, i don't care what's happening we could be in the middle of a 
right. really important settlement. I'm dropping it. I'm walking. I'm going to the side of the stage. That's that's the luxury of of the job. You know. Well, don't and, you know what song? Don't you know that song's coming? I mean, do you see the you see the set list? Right? See the set list, but yeah, but you know, there are audibles and you know, and it's not. Yeah. Wilco doesn't play the same set every night, so you know. Yeah. What's there are some songs that make it in most nights, but you know, right? Not all of them, and that one's not that one's not not in you know all the how they, how sure. do they deal with the set list uh, stuff? I mean, does Jeff kind of drive that process? I'm going to assume Jeff drives the process, but they also Wilco has a uh, fan request link uh, for oh, every single yeah, show right. uh-huh. on their page, and that is absolutely printed out and given to Jeff uh, every single time. Um, he'll come with a provisional set, and they'll have that in time for a sound check. And the band will look at it and say, oh, my gosh, you need to work on this one because that has been the set for a while or right. whatever. Uh, and they'll sort of work all that out. And that will sort of marinate and sit there for a while. And then maybe there's something you still have a question about. They have a jam room um, that's set up backstage. Uh, it's just a really small, very simple setup that they all can play together. Is that like consistent in every venue so that that's kind of part of the deal? They have to have like a separate room where they can get together away from we will, everybody? We will do whatever it takes to find a spot for them. Okay. to do that yeah, yeah. also yeah. they're not none of the guys in Wilco are precious so if that spot happens to be in catering because that's the only place we can find to put it yeah you they're know fine. They're, they're fine you know they're not these aren't don't look me in the eyes as i walk to the stage guys these are these are right pack your lunch in your in your lunch box and go to work guys you know right so that's interesting yeah but cool there you go Right. There you go. It's a, good, it's a great job. I don't know what else to say. I mean, it's a, it's a great job. Yeah, you know, it's like, I, it's yeah. a weird job. There's no security. There's no anything. It's up, it's down, it's over and out. It's a gig economy. You know, something happens to any one person, an entire tour can get canceled and go away. I've been through all that, but I wouldn't change a thing. Right. Well, I mean, clearly the professionalism of the Wilco operation extends to you uh you're like a sweetheart of a guy i've really enjoyed the conversation um you might, yeah you yeah. might call around to some live nation promoters and just double check that story but uh <laughs> <laughs> yeah i haven't really uh, checked my sources or you know looked for corroboration on that but i'm just gonna go i'm gonna go with no, this I, for right now eric what do you think i mean <laughs> i think it's fine i like uh i i take pride that i think 90 percent or 99 percent of venues are excited when Wilco buses roll up and they're excited when I walk off the bus, I think, right, you know, right. whether that's a fiction I'm telling myself or that's the truth, but I, I do believe it. And I think that's because of the hard work everyone in that entire organization does. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's such in, in, in this, in these tough times, I mean, are you kind of looking at next summer at this point? I think that's the best hope. Yeah. Um, there are so many variables and there are so many ways to get back on the road. Uh, if, you know, instant testing became available and it was cost effective, then we could go back to work tomorrow. Uh, but, you know, mm-hmm. fans are probably going to have to realize that if tests cost five bucks, ticket prices are probably going to go up five bucks. Um, right. You know, uh, there are so many things to, to, to work have like an instant out. test is what you're thinking. Like, yeah, like if there's a truth before test you go to a show. You, absolutely. You walk in, you, you know, breathe into a breathalyzer thing you have covid no go on in you have covid yeah, yes so long. this, this right. way you know uh that would allow large gatherings to happen again you know and then obviously yeah. a vaccine that was uh, effective would allow that um and the but, time that it's going to take to distribute it not just a vaccine out right yeah I mean, yeah do you kind of envision like socially distant shows we did a drive-in Hurry. show with jeff a while back oh yeah uh, but i mean in out here right at the McHenry yeah. place uh-huh. yeah um, and it was really fun and neat and, um, cathartic to mm-hmm. do a show. Right, um, for sure. uh, but at the same time, I don't know that say the theater held 800 cars, we could sell 400 cars worth of space. Um, you scale that up of what promoter needed to do. You had to get a stage, you get a PA, you had to get lights, you know, you, it's right. just really, really hard to make that a viable way of doing business it's okay for one off or two does um, does making does incorporating a live stream into that model help it does if it's successful but this is another place where like jeff is amazing like he live streamed that show but all the money went to charity pretty much i think so right but know. i mean under like a tour circumstance i mean i mean i'm i, I kind of um been thinking about 
uh, what's it going to look like when bands come back? And clearly there's going to be a level of social distancing that probably limits capacity, I think, in a lot yeah. of different venues. So we're, everyone's not shoulder to shoulder right from the go. Right. Um, and then the development of live streaming technologies and um, stream sites, et cetera, um, and the success of that and combine those two, you know, it, it, I, I sort of, do you think that makes it a little bit more um, economically viable? I do. I have a million questions. Like, are people going to be like, oh, I saw the show and buy one live stream over the course of a tour because that's not going to work? Or are they going to be like yeah. Grateful Dead fans and watch every single show no matter what? I mean, there are just right. so many variables. And uh, well, What about one every like five shows or something like that? Yeah, I think it. I think everything's going to help. Assuming, assuming that everyone that Wilco fans may not, may or may not watch every single show. I mean, I assume there, there's, you know, there's always a, a core group of hardcore fans that would do that. Yeah, um, I mean, it's just really hard to predict. I'd love to give you a solid answer and say there's a thing, but as I, I was just wondering about what you're my, what you're thinking and what you're seeing, basically, there's no right or wrong answer at this point. It's kind of like yeah. We, I mean, internally, as I talk with other, you know, tour manager, production managers and, and crew members and, you know, Will Crew tries to have a weekly, you know, Will Crew chat and stay in touch and stuff. And yeah. we all kind of report back what we've heard around and, and whatnot. And at, at the end of every single one, there's hope, but no answers. So. Yep. You know, that's, that's hope, but no answers. Where, that's kind of the yeah. theme, the theme of the days. Yeah. Anyway, thanks so much, Eric, for being yeah, here. Yeah, no problem. I really appreciate it. I had a good time. And I hope I didn't uh, yap too much. No, you yapped to just the right amount, man. I really All appreciated right. it. Uh, hopefully you'll hold on for a couple seconds because I'd sure. like to say goodbye. Yeah. Um, thanks again for being with Roadcase, Eric. Talk to you no soon. Problem. Thanks for having me. Bye. 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 Okay, well, there you have it. World Inside wilco's touring machine from eric frankhauser super interesting love the stories eric's really got a good philosophical attitude big problems stay calm attack your problems run toward them even got a story about peter buck in there that was pretty hilarious um and eric just loves the music you know that's really important understanding what the shows mean to the fans you have a purpose you're putting on great shows you're getting the band from city to city really fascinating stuff and thanks again to eric for being my first guest on road case so once again thanks for joining me if you'd like to contact me with questions comments suggestions for guests or just say hi you can email me info at roadcasepod.com or through the socials, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, at RoadcasePod. And if you'd like to support RoadCase, you can do so at patreon.com slash RoadCasePod. I want to thank Waltzer for the great RoadCase theme music, and I want to thank all of you for joining me on this very first episode of RoadCase. It's been really special. I've been super psyched to be here. Can't wait to see you at the next episodes. We got a lot of great stuff coming up in the weeks and months to come. So I'll see you on the road. Yeah.